Hi, this is Scott Morrison. Welcome to the Foothills Calvary YouTube channel. We're a church located in Lakewood, Colorado as part of the Calvary Chapel movement. Our goal is to provide an opportunity for you to hear the whole word of God preached chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and follow along as we read God's word together. We hope you find this channel encouraging and that God speaks to you through his word and through the Holy Spirit. And the title today is really, it's going to be the title of this study as we go through, and it's End Time Battle Cry. And this will be part one, and next week we'll do part two, and then see how many parts we go after that. Um, the author of the book of Jude, and our main text is Jude 1 through 6. The author of the book of Jude is the brother of James, half-brother of Jesus. Jude is closely related to the book of Second Peter. Uh, the date of the authorship of Jude depends on whether Jude uh, used content from Second Peter or Peter used content from Jude when writing Second Peter. The uh, book of Jude was written to Christians somewhere in uh, A.D. 60 to 80. The book of Jude is important for us today um, because it was written for the end times in all reality, for the end of the church age. The church age began in the day of Pentecost, and Jude is the only book given entirely to apostasy, the falling away of the church. Jude writes that evil works are evidence of apostasy, and he admonishes us to contend for the faith. Now, these are the tares, uh, uh, there, for there are tares among the wheat. False prophets are in the church, and saints are in danger. Jude is small, but it's an important book worthy of study. It's written and, and it's relevant. It's written for us even today as Christians. Jude was anxious actually to write them about salvation, but he changed the topic. There's that Holy Spirit piece again when you're going to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit's telling you. It shifts what it is that you're doing. He changed the topic to address contending for the faith. This faith embodies the, the complete body of, of Christian doctrine taught by Christ, and it was later passed on to the apostles. After Jude warns of false teachers, he advises us on how we can succeed in spiritual warfare. Here is wisdom we would do well to accept and adhere to as we go through these days, as, these, as we go through these end times. We truly do live in a unique time in history, and this little book can help equip us for untold challenges in living the, the times we're in now. Today's Christian must be on guard more than ever for false doctrine and for blatant sin, which is even seen, that can so easily deceive us if we are not well-versed in God's Word. That's why I challenge you continually. You have to be in the Bible more than on Sunday morning. We need to know the gospel message inside and out. We need to protect that message. We need to defend that message. We need to accept the lordship of Jesus Christ and, and, and that there should be evidence of a life change in us. We, we shouldn't be the same after we've accepted him. Our life in Christ should reflect our heart knowledge and, and the rest with the authority of the almighty creator, the, the, the authority of God the Father who loves you so much. We need that personal relationship with him, and only then will we know his voice. We'll know it so well that we'll be able to follow him and see through the falsehoods and the, the false doctrine and teachings. The warnings of history to the ungodly, the danger that prompted Jude to write this letter, and it's Jude 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept, in, kept for Jesus Christ. Uh, the name Jude is actually literally Judas, but to avoid connection with Judas Iscariot, you remember who he is, the infamous, infamous man who betrayed Jesus. Uh, most English translators have used the name Jude. Jude, like the, the other half-brother of Jesus, including James, uh, uh, the author of the book that we finished studying, they didn't believe, his brothers didn't believe that he was the Messiah until after the resurrection. And even though Jude was a blood relative of Jesus, he, was, he considered himself only as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Would you say you're a bond servant of your sibling? <laughs> no, you wouldn't. I wouldn't. They're my servant. No, I'm sorry. Even though Jude was a blood relative of Jesus, he considered himself to be that bond servant. How would you introduce yourself if Jesus was your brother? I think we would probably pull the Jesus card first. Yeah, I'm Scott, <clears throat> Jesus' brother. Because that's what pride does. 
right? But Jude shows humility in his introduction. That the blood shed at the cross was more important than family blood. He understood. You could say with Paul, with Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 16, the last part of the verse, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. As a member of the Sanhedrin, it's very likely that Saul, who became Paul, had heard Jesus speak in Jerusalem, and certainly Saul had heard about Jesus and was determined to put an end to his followers. And suddenly he saw the light in Damascus on that road. And from that point on, Paul no longer knew Jesus after the flesh. He saw him in a different light. As a result, Paul saw all men differently. How do you see people? He didn't see their earthly bodies. He, he saw only who they could become in Christ. And, and that's what I see. That's the way I see, see you when I look at you, what you can become in Christ. If you're obedient to him, how much he could do. And that's the prayer that we should all have for, for everyone we know. Lord, help us see the potential that they have in you and help us do our part in that process. Help us to disciple, to encourage, to exhort. This letter's not evangelistic in focus. It focuses on things that the believers need to hear but don't necessarily want to hear. So how do we know it's to Christians? They were called a person is a Christian because God has called them. They were beloved in God the Father or sanctified by God the Father, meaning they were set apart from the world and, and they were set apart unto God. And then they were kept in Jesus. Jesus Christ, our guardian and protector. Verse two, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Paul would start his letters with grace and peace to you, as we've seen. Oh, that we would greet each other the same way. I think the closest thing we have is, is when Jeff Bailey tells you shalom on the way out the door. Can we not greet each other the same way? Grace and peace be to you. Judas' heart was, was one of mercy, peace, and love, not to be added, but to be multiplied in our lives. His heart was truly to see them do well. And then he shifts right to the main drive of the writing. Verse 3, beloved, uh, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Jude's initial desire was to write about our common salvation, but then something happened. We're not sure. I, I, well, I, I think it was the Holy Spirit moving him and guiding him. Jude found it necessary to write a different letter we might say that this letter really didn't want to be written. Jude essentially is preaching against dangerous practices and doctrines and things that put the gospel of Christ in, in peril, in danger. And this is something that we've got to take as seriously as Jude does. We cannot be passive about our faith anymore. For so long, we've lived life comfortably in America. And so many Christians just walk that gray line. It's this big gray highway. There's no gray highway. It's black or white. You've either got to be in or out. The Holy Spirit's direction through Jude and Jude's obedience, it brings us this book and it has a warning that carries just as true today as the day it was written. Every generation thinks that, oh, this is it. This is the big one. World War I, World War II, all the other big wars in between, little conflicts that start up everywhere. Well, now we have a war in Israel. Oh, this has got to be it. I'm not going to go into that study right now. It's time. Rapture, anyone? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's go. Ah, but until he comes, we have work to do. We don't just sit and wait. That should be at the forefront of our minds, but we're, we're, we know things are crazy, but not without hope. We get to spend eternity in heaven with the Father. Are you anticipating that? Are you looking forward to that? Or are you just trying to get through the day? Oh, I don't want to anticipate. Whew, man, can you imagine being in heaven right now and worshiping? I don't know, are we gonna have a Sunday service? Mm -hmm. We're gonna have everyday service. Common salvation, not in the sense that it's cheap or just anybody can have it, but in the sense that we are part of the community of believers. We have salvation in Christ. That's in common. 
That's what brings that kindred spirit amongst believers. Uh, when Rachel was saying that about, man, we walked in the door, we felt love. You know what? That's that kindred spirit. That's, that's followers of Christ. That's, that's believers meeting together, loving God and loving each other. The same biblical worldview. We have the, the same attitude towards God and his creation. Uh, we, we see throughout scripture that, that there's only one way for salvation for the rich, for the poor, the good, the bad, the pretty, and the ugly. If it isn't a common salvation, it isn't God's salvation, and it isn't salvation at all. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. This is why we can't allow the devil to distract us with thoughts of other ways to be saved and, or to isolate us. Because of COVID, we found it so easy to isolate. Ah, just stay at home. I can watch it all. I can order everything on my, on my phone. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner can come. I don't need to leave. Oh, I don't need to go to church. I can, now we have it. We have online for a reason. It's a great tool, but it becomes an excuse. We cannot be isolated. We need the body of Christ. To be a Christian is to be part of community. To be a Christian means that we stand shoulder to shoulder with millions of Christians who have gone before us. We stand uh, with the strong Christian. We stand with the weak Christian. We stand with brave Christians. We, we stand with cowardly Christians. We stand with old Christians and young Christians. And we're part of an invisible, mighty army that spans through the generations. We're not alone. Spurgeon says, upon other matters, there are distinctions among believers, but there's a common salvation enjoyed by the Armenian as well as the Calvinist. <gasps> Sorry. The same thing is possessed by the Presbyterian as well as the Episcopalian, prized by the Quaker as well as the Baptist. Those who are in Christ are more near akin than they know of it. And their intense unity and deep essential truth is a greater force than most of them imagine. Only give it scope and it will work wonders. In the 80s, there was a survey and it said that 70% of Americans who went to church said that you can be a good Christian without going to church. Okay. I would say today that that's probably closer to 90 to 95% of people would say that. But this doesn't match with Jude's idea of common salvation. He feels it necessary to exhort them to contend earnestly for the faith. The Holy Spirit moved him in such a way that he had to address uh, uh, doing the hard work of faith. In the Greek, that word contend comes from the athletic world, from the, the wrestling mat. It is a more intense use of the word. It means to agonize. That sounds great. Anybody want to agonize? Agonize for your faith. But it's literally to do the hard work, to be diligent in doing the hard work, to build your faith, to grow. Listen, we, we can't expect a microwave faith or a drive through McDonald's faith. It's not going to be of any great benefit to us. It's not easy to grow in our faith. It takes work, but oh, it's worth it. As our faith grows and that muscle strengthens, we can take that next breath. The Greek verb translated contend earnestly is considered present infinitive, meaning that you and I being a Christian, ready for this exhortation, encouragement, you and I being a Christian is going to be a constant struggle. Amen. Amen? We don't want the constant struggle, but we do that struggle because it's valuable. If you and I were walking into an art gallery or a high-end store and there were no safeguards and, you know, the diamonds are laying everywhere and there's no security system, you would easily draw the conclusion that what is in there is cheap and worthless, right? Oh, man, if they're not even going to guard it or secure it, it's got to be worthless. You see, valuable things are protected. Worthless things are not. So my question for you this morning is, how do you contend for your faith? How do we contend for, for our faith? It's being an unflinching witness. You're going to share the gospel. You're going to give a reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and, gentleness and compassion, and you're not going to flinch. You're going to hand out tracts. You're going to help train and disciple ambassadors for Christ. You're going to strengthen the hands of a, of a pastor or a, a missionary who honors the word of God from the pulpit. 
We contend for the faith in practical sense when we live uncompromising as Christians and we give credit continuously to the Lord. It's not something you did. God did it. Give the glory to him. Faithful missionaries and evangelists contend earnestly for the faith, but so does the children's worker. So does the youth leader. So does a small group leader or, or the office staff of a church. Your, your team leads here at this church. All of these things cause us to be more faithful to Scripture. The more we engage and the more we serve, the more we own the ministry, the more we own that faith in our relationship with God. Each one of you should, should contend for the gospel wherever God has put you. Is it at home? Is it at work? Is it in the marketplace? But especially a hearer at the church where it's a safe place. Contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all handed down to the saints. Here Jude tells us what we're contending for. Uh, there's a lot of earnest contention in our world today, but usually not for the right things. The faith once for all delivered to the saints is something worth contending for. This faith, it, it doesn't mean our own personal belief or faith in the sense of our trust in God. This phrase, the faith, means the essential truths of the gospel that, are, that all true Christians hold in common. Bloom says that we must contend earnestly for the truth. The faith is the body of truth that very early in the church's history took a definite form. It's a genuine dedication from the deepest part of our heart and soul. Acts 2.42, one of my favorite scriptures. You hear me say it all the time. I just don't put the address on it. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Let's be that church, amen? Continually. If we're to grow in our faith, if we're to fulfill the mission that Jesus has given us, that we contend earnestly. If we're going to do that, it's imperative that we regularly gather together for instruction, worship, encouragement, and prayer. God never calls any Christian to do life on their own. Never. We do it together. Not in a solitary life. It's in fellowship with other believers that we become all that he has created us to be. That's why we need the body. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 reiterates this. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's crucial for us as believers to gather and have corporate worship, instruction, encouragement, and service. God simply did not design us to go it alone in our Christian faith, to grow in isolation. You're not an experiment like your bowl of whatever you put in the fridge and you left it there a month ago. You know what I'm talking about. It's not an isolation. Our participation in the local church not only protects our personal fellowship with the Lord, but it's a vital aspect of how he matures us and transforms us into his image. You guys spur me on, exhort me, encourage me. You help me and guide me as I mature in my walk with the Lord. Prayerfully, I do the same. Early in Hebrews 3, the writer says, we're to encourage each other day after day after day after day after... See what I'm saying? every day so we're not caught off guard by the deceitfulness of sin and becoming hardened by it how quickly have you and you probably know somebody where they were serving the Lord but then they got caught up in sin and they kind of took a left turn and, and they started pushing God away and they started walking away even further and become harder and harder and harder don't do that that's the importance of us being in the word and us being together in fellowship the Apostle Paul, who was Saul, got knocked off his high horse by the Holy Spirit. He was transformed and surrounded by believers. Some of them were pretty skeptical at first, weren't they? This guy was trying to kill us. Now he's saying, Jesus is the thing? Like, is that good? But then because he began to contend earnestly, 
for the truth, for faith, because he began to, to passionately pursue truth. Many lives were changed. And they continue to be changed today because of his obedience. Hold fast without wavering because God is faithful. We need to speak life. We need to exhort and encourage each other every chance that we get. That's why I say mercy and, and grace and peace to you. That should be our greeting. That should be our greeting to each other. Every chance we get. We need to meet regularly and, and now, especially as we have the freedom to do so. Do, do we know how how fragile that freedom is? COVID hit and what'd they do? Shut the church down. Guess what? That's not gonna happen again. <clears throat> Just for the record, but we'll move on. Um, we need to, to, to meet while we have the freedom to meet. We need to grow and, and, and absorb all that God has for us while we have the freedom and ability to do so. Uh, my mom and, and Doyle ingrained something in me and uh, as a kid, I didn't always appreciate it. <clears throat> but if the church doors were open, we were going. Sunday morning, nine o'clock Sunday school, then worship service after that. Um, after worship service, then it was to Wyatt's or Furs for lunch, where you could only get four items. Not Sorry, that was something else. No bitterness there. Then there was Sunday night Bible study. That was from 6 to 7.30, 8 o'clock. Then there was a midweek service. Oh my goodness, how many times can you go to church? Every time the doors are open. Every opportunity we can get together and fellowship and be in the word. And, and now I see that. I see the value of that. And, and Pam and I adopted that same mentality when our marriage was restored. And, and our kids went with us everywhere. And our, it turned out okay. They love the Lord. They're pursuing God. They went everywhere with us. They went to church. They went on mission trips. They went to soup kitchens. Got crazy stories about that too. Small, small group Bible study at our house. Guys, it is okay to saturate our lives with Bible study, church, worship, God's word continually. We need to do it. Amen. Joshua 24, 15, if it is desirable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers that they serve beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites whose land you're living in. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That statement needs to be made, be made with an exclamation point on a daily basis. There's too much mess in the world. We've got to be determined. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And maybe it's just you in your house. Good. As for you and your house, serve the Lord. Be determined. And it's not a guilt trip here. You got to pray through things in your own family, but you need to engage at another level. God, what is it that you want me to do? How do you want me to engage? And let me do it well. Let me do it with intention. Let me do it with purpose. And all to give you glory and honor. Help me as a family to contend for the faith. The faith which was once for all handed down. It means that faith that we're contending for was delivered one time. That's all we need. It doesn't need to be delivered over and over and over again. You and I share the gospel. We distribute that truth over and over. But it's the same truth. It's truth that was delivered one time by God and then through the apostles and the prophets. Ephesians 2.20 says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. This is where Jude is cautioning us. He's saying, hey guys, there's, there's teachers seeking to destroy. They're seeking to, to break down that foundation. They come in saying that, hey, we got a new fresh word for you. Come hear this. Now, God may indeed, and I believe he does, still speak today, but never in the authoritative way that he spoke through the prophets in the Old Testament or the first apostles or the prophets that are spoken of in the New Testament. There are many, many, many false prophets in our world. There are many false prophets in Colorado. Many that I know personally that I need to take a bucket of rocks and go talk to them. All right, I'll stop there. I mean, if we're going to believe in the Old Testament that way. Erdman said, there is no other gospel. There will be none. Its content will be more fully understood. Its implications will be developed. Its predictions will be fulfilled, but it will never be supplemented or succeeded or supplanted. The 
gospel message does not change. It is what it is. For all. For all. For God so loved the cool people that he made. No. For God so loved the whole world. The whole world. Not just a few people here and there. He sent his son for all. It means that this faith is accessible for everyone. Everyone. Too many people try to make up their own faith, though. They say they're, they're being true to God. We don't have an option to simply make up our own faith and still be true to God. This faith is for all, but today it isn't a popular thing to say or to believe in the, the faith that was once delivered for all the saints. Instead, most people want to believe in, in the faith they might make up as they go. They, they decide on the way, kind of what's right for them. And well, if that's good for me, it's good for me. And well, what's good for you? Yeah, you just do your thing. That's good. No, the truth is the truth. More people believe today believe in the faith that is in my heart than the faith that is once and for all delivered to the saints. There's a book called Habits of the Heart by uh, Robert Bella. And he and his colleagues wrote about an interview with a young nurse and her name was Sheila Larson. They described as, a, as representing many Americans' experience and views on religion. Speaking about her own faith and how it operated in her life, she said, I believe in God. I'm not a religious fanatic. I can't remember the last time I went to church. My faith has carried me along the way. It is Sheilaism. It's just my own little voice. We might say that this highly individualistic faith is the most popular religion in the world, but the idea that we can or should put together our own faith is wrong. Christianity is based on one faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. It is only through Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His salvation remains eternally secure. And those who confess and believe, it's worth fighting for. So we must contend for the faith no matter what challenge we face. We've got to do the work. We've got to put in the time. Verse 4, why contend? Because there are dangerous persons in the midst of Christians. Verse 4, the certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out of this con condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of God into licentiousness, licit easier to say, and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. It's important to remember that, that certain biblical inferences of man or my, mankind, right? When we say man or we hear that in the, in the Bible, it, it includes you ladies, you're not off the hook. Certain persons or certain men, as the New King James says, have crept in unnoticed. What makes this statement so dangerous is that they came in unnoticed. They weren't wearing a dangerous man t-shirt or a false teacher name tag. Those charlatans came in claiming that they have more biblical knowledge than everybody else. They have extra biblical knowledge, a new revelation, and they just kind of come in the side door. We've had them attempt that here. They haven't lasted very long. Spurgeon said Satan knows right well that one devil in the church can do far more than a thousand outside her bounds. Another reason why we have to stay in the word and work through this in unity. But that's all it takes. One person sowing seeds of deception. And according to this verse, they're marked for deception. As Judas Iscariot was destined to betray, betray Christ. These certain persons are destined to be false teachers or leaders where their condemnation is their end. They're ungodly simply in the sense that they are not like God and no matter the outward appearances, they disregard God. So they may be unnoticed by us, but not by God. It's the same thing with, with everything that happens on the earth right now. God is not surprised by what's going on in Israel or Ukraine. He's not surprised by the famine, the sickness, or the evil that's occurring on a daily basis. He's also not worried about the deceivers. Those who deceive through their lifestyles and their teaching, their judgment is assured. The truth will win out. 
Our responsibility is to make sure that we're on the right side of truth, that we're staying focused on God's word. Yet another reminder that God will indeed use the righteous and the unrighteous in our lives and in our world to bring his will to pass. He'll use the godly, he'll use the ungodly to bring his will into fruition. Who turned the grace of our God into lice, lice, I don't know why I had so much hard time saying that, licentiousness or lewdness, let's use that word. So these certain persons have received some sort of grace from God, but they've turned it into an unbridled lust or excess, wantonness, outrageousness, shameless insolence, excessive indulgence and sensual pleasures. It's animalistic. We've talked about that before. Lustful, flesh-driven actions and words. This was condemned not only by Jesus, but in Jude and but the, the Apostle Paul and and Peter. The idea behind this word is, is sin. It's, it's practiced without shame. It's, it's without any sense of conscience or, or decency. Usually the word is used in the sense of sensual sins, such as sexual immorality. But it can also be used in the sense of brazen, anti-biblical teaching. When the truth is denied and lies are taught without shame, Jude probably had both ideas in mind here because as the rest of the letter develops, these certain persons, both moral problems and doctrinal problems are seen. These words of Jude show that there's a danger in preaching grace. There are some who take the truth of God's grace and they turn the grace of God into something evil. But it doesn't mean there's anything wrong or dangerous about the message of God's grace. It's what's done with it. It simply shows how corrupt, how corrupt the human heart is. As we recognize sin in our lives, we have to deal with it. When God brings it to you and you see it, you've got to remove it immediately. You've got to remove that sin and anybody or anything attached to that sin, get rid of it. Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Paul couldn't imagine why anybody would genuinely love Christ and want to continue committing sins, the very sins that cost Jesus his life. How could any real believer glory in what God abhors? That's where that prayer in Psalms 139 comes, and I mention it often. You know what? God knows everything about you, and he still loves you. And you get to the end of that, and it is. Lord, show me where I'm unrighteous. Help me see where I'm sinning, and help me to make it right. Help me understand my salvation. I must not continue in sin as God reveals it to me. You must not continue in sin, in sin as God reveals it to you. God offers us a chance at forgiveness. He offers grace. He gives us mercy. Grace, that gift extended to us. Take the gift. Ask for forgiveness. Get away from that sin. These certain persons in today's text did not do that and actually deny the Lord. They do this by refusing to recognize who Jesus said he was, and therefore they also deny who God the Father is. This reads as a report without detail of how they specifically did this, but it, it may be that they denied him with their ungodly lifestyle or deny, denied him with heresy or, or the, the doctrine they were teaching. Most likely both were true. In verse five, we see the beginning of three examples of, uh, that show the certainty of God's judgment against these certain persons. Three examples that show uh, certainty of God's judgment. And, and we're gonna get through two of them this morning as we get ready to close. And then we'll pick up next week on the third one. But verse five says, now I desire to remind you, though you all know things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Jude knew that he wasn't telling them anything new. They were already taught this example. They, they knew it. But they needed to hear it again to apply it to their present situation. Really, that's, that's the reality of a pastor's job, right? It's to get up and just remind us. To repeat 
I, I need it repeated to me. I need to learn and rem oh yeah, that was right. God, you did that thing. It's a reminder. I get up here and I remind you of what you already know. It's the importance of us studying the Bible consistently, especially as we contend for the faith in what seems to be the end times. Each of us as Christians should respond with, yes, Jude, I know exactly what you're talking about as you refer to the Old Testament. But if for some reason this morning you don't know what he's referring to, then the challenge is for you to deepen your understanding of the Bible. Spurgeon said, as for the root facts, the fundamental doctrines, the primary truths of Scripture, we must from day to day insist upon them. We must never say to them, everybody knows them. For alas, everybody forgets them. It's the same thing I've talked about when we do the altar call at the end of service. I determined from the very beginning when I stepped into the platform and behind this pulpit that we will give that opportunity every Sunday. And we've had Sundays where three, four, five people have responded. We've had Sundays where none have. But the one Sunday that impacted me the most was somebody who had been at the church for a long time responded. I thought they were saved. Oh, later they said, you know what? I finally understand. As you were explaining the gospel, I understood it, and I received Christ. See, we need to be reminded. We need to hear it. And we also follow that quote up with a quote by John Calvin. The use of God's word is not only to teach what we could not have otherwise known, but to rouse us to a serious meditation of the things which we already understand and not to suffer us to grow torpid or cold in knowledge. The idea is that we are being exhorted in God's word when we hear it. And it challenges us. Well, I already knew that, but you know, you've read that verse, and then you go back a year later and you read that verse again, and you're like, oh, wow, did you see that? That's how the Holy Spirit works. Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, Jude reminds us of what happened in Numbers 14. God delivered the people out of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. They went out of Egypt, and without unintended delays, they came to a place of, uh, called Kadesh Barnea, on the threshold of the promised land. But at Kadesh Barnea, the people refused to trust God and to go into the promised land of Canaan. Therefore, almost none of the adult generation who left Egypt entered into the promised land. And as we read the Old Testament, we see story of God's provisions and God's blessings and then discipline because they didn't believe. They stopped believing. Think of what God did for the people of Israel in this situation and then how they responded to him. They experienced firsthand God's miraculous deliverance. Can you imagine the Red Sea? That's something you're not going to forget. They crossed. They heard the voice of God at Mount Sinai. They received his daily care, his provision. There was manna in the wilderness, yet they still lapsed into unbelief. So they never entered into the place of, bl of blessing and rest that God had for them. All those who doubted and rejected, rejected God, well, they paid a bigger price. A bigger price than not just entering the promised land. They received the judgment of God. Psalms 95 describes how the Lord reacted to them. Psalms 95, 10 through 11. For 40 years I loathed, loathed that generation and they are a people who err in their heart. They do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, truly they shall not enter into my rest. Ouch. That's scary. Jude brings a clear warning that the people of Israel started out in Egypt doing well enough. They, they were doing good. They had many blessings from God along the way, but they did not endure to the end because they did not believe God's promise and power and protection. How many times do I pray, Lord, I believe, forgive my unbelief. I believe, I know you're there. I know you've done it before. I'm trusting you'll do it again. This example gives two lessons. First, it assures us that the certain persons causing trouble will certainly be judged, even though they may have started out well in their walk with God. Jude says that these certain persons or men might have started out well, but so did the children of Israel, and God afterward destroyed them that did not believe. Secondly, it warns that we must follow Jesus to the end and never be among those who did not believe. The final test of, of our Christianity, of our faith, is endurance. Some start the race but never finish. 
here we see both the love and justice of God. The Lord showed his goodness in, in rescuing the Israelites from Egyptian slavery, but, but his holiness in punishing their stubborn unbelief and disobedience. It cost the nation of Israel 40 years, 40 years of death and disease and doubt and war and wandering in the wilderness because people doubted that God would truly give them the promised land. And it's just doubt. They rebelled against him. Verse 6, the angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode. We're going to touch on this a little bit today, and then we'll, we'll pick it up again next Sunday. And he's kept in internal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Jude's letter is famous for bringing up obscure or controversial points as well, and this is one of them. Jude speaks of the angels who sinned and are now imprisoned, awaiting future judgment. There's some measure of controversy about the identity of these particular angels. We only know two places in the Bible where it speaks of angels sinning. First, there's the original rebellion of some of the angels against God, Isaiah 14, and, and again, you can see it in Revelation 12. And secondly, there was the sin of the sons of God described in Genesis 6. Genesis 6, 1 through 2, now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, the daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. There's a significant debate as to the sons of God. Are they angelic beings, or is it another way of saying followers of God among humans? And Jude helps answer that question. The offense was connected with some kind of a sexual sin, such as the, the sexual sin, a union between rebellious angelic beings and the sons of God, the human beings, the, the daughters of men. We know there was some sexual aspect to that sin because Jude tells us in the following verse in Jude 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, and they went after strange flesh. The words uh, in a similar manner refers back to the angels of Jude 6. And the, the words gone after strange flesh refers to their unnatural union that they made. We know that this unnatural union produced unnatural offspring. Unnatural union that corrupted the genetic pool of mankind. So what did God do? He found a man named Noah. Perfect man in his generations, pure genetics. This unnatural union prompted an incredibly drastic judgment of God, a global flood wiping out all of mankind except for eight people. We can add another piece of knowledge from Jude 6. The unnatural union prompted God to uniquely imprison angels who sinned in this way, kept in internal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. God judged these wicked angels setting them in everlasting chains. Can you imagine that? They're still there. They're still bound. Apparently some fallen angels are in bondage while others are unbound and they're active among mankind as demons. By not keeping the proper place, they are now kept in chains. Their sinful pursuit of freedom put them in bondage. And in the same way, those who insist on the freedom to do whatever they want to, just like these angels, they will be bound in everlasting chains. Guys, listen, true obedience comes, uh, or true freedom comes from obedience in God. If we're going to be obedient to him, we're going to pursue him, then there's truly freedom. It's when we're caught and bound in sin. That, that's not good. We lose it all. And if angels can't break the, the chains that sin brought upon them, we're foolish to think that humans could do the same. We can't set ourselves free of these chains, but we can through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that comes and breaks those chains of sin on us. That example from Jude gives us two lessons. One, it assures us that a certain person's causing trouble, they will be judged no matter what their spiritual status has been. Those angels, at one time, they stood in the presence of God. Can you imagine that? But now they're in everlasting change, chains. If God judged the angels who sinned, he will certainly judge those certain persons. Secondly, it warns us that we must continue walking with Jesus. If the past spiritual experience of these angels didn't guarantee their future spiritual state, then neither does ours. We must keep walking and stay on guard. As I say, keep your head on a swivel. Pay attention. These angels who were cast out of heaven fell because of their pride and their lust. Pride is the basis for every sin 
because the person refuses to admit his or her need for God. A prideful person attempts to fulfill his or her own desires in, in many number of ways, and it often leads to sexual sins, to addictions, to other destructive habits. Ultimately, these end in a spiritual, emotional, mental devastation. Only the Lord has the ability to satisfy the yearning of our hearts, and he assumes full responsibility for our needs if we obey him. Not our wants, our needs. The reality is that we are indeed in the end times. What does that look like? Our focus must become stronger, not to be distracted, not to get off course. We can't allow the enemy to distract us. We must contend for the faith. So the cry for each of us, 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 5, preach the word. That's you too, not just me. Teach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. What are you supposed to be ready? All the time. What are you supposed to do? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And we're living in this time right now for a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. They'll turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Oh, but I'm not an evangelist. Mm -hmm. You're called. You can give a reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and compassion. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry that God has called you to do. Contend for the faith. Because we are in a spiritual war. And it does impact the physical body. And this is indeed a time for a battle cry, to be ready, to prepare, contend for the faith. Dig in, go deeper. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power and the life that that word brings us. Help us, Lord, to be obedient in that. Help us to contend for the faith, to, to do the hard work to be engaged in our faith in such a way that, that we make an impact for your kingdom to bring you glory and to bring you honor. Help us, Lord, to go to war. Help us to put on that full armor and press in. Not sitting on our backsides watching, but engaging. Help us to keep sin in check and not allow it to, to bring us into bondage. So, Lord, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And we ask that you empower us to proclaim that message to others. In Jesus' name, amen. And as we close every service, it's that reminder that God does indeed have you here for a reason and a purpose. Many of you in this room and many listening online, you're already saved. You've, you've surrendered your life to the Lord, but some of you have not. Some of you, you need to do that. And you feel that, that prompting, that stirring within your your just the inside of you. You feel it. You know that the Holy Spirit's drawing you in. The reality is that Jesus came to the earth to die on the cross for your sins and mine. And then we have a broken relationship with God. And, and as soon as we can restore that, we can only restore it through accepting Christ. It's, it's confessing and believing. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And it's a simple conversation between you and God. So I'm gonna ask everybody to just bow your heads, close your, close your eyes. And we're just going to say just a quick prayer, a simple prayer. Really, it's a conversation from your heart to God's heart. Pray something like this. Dear God, I know I need you in my life. And I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for my sins. I surrender to you. I simply submit and I, I confess that Jesus is Lord. And I believe, I believe, God, that you raised him from the dead. So Jesus, be Lord of my life. Help me. Use me to bring hope to others. Help me to contend for the faith on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to pray with you, get you a Bible, talk to you. If you prayed it online, you can shoot me an email, scott at foothillscalvary.org, and I'll get back to you as well.